One of my personal all-time favourite video games is Final Fantasy VII, the iconic turn-based Japanese role-playing game that would help propel its entire gaming genre to dizzy new heights of popularity. The game felt like the largest and most epic video game that had ever been produced, permanently changing the face of gaming as a result. The game would wow consumers with its state-of-the-art polygonal graphics in battles, stunning hand-drawn backgrounds, a huge world map to explore, an orchestral soundtrack, memorable characters and so much more. This game was something else. Pair all of this with a story-driven narrative that emotionally invested players to levels never seen in the entertainment medium before, Final Fantasy VII literally had it all. To this very day, Final Fantasy VII and the original Sony PlayStation are now synonymous with each other, which is to be expected really considering the game's widespread critical acclaim and the fact that over 12.8 million copies were sold worldwide. Referring to Final Fantasy VII as legendary by this point is a bit of an understatement. But obviously prior to this groundbreaking game's release, all previous Final Fantasy games had appeared exclusively on Nintendo platforms. So join me today as we look back at the earliest development phases of Final Fantasy VII and the plans for this game at one point to turn up on Nintendo hardware. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of Final Fantasy VII on the Nintendo 64. Oh yes, Final Fantasy, the Japanese anthology science fiction media franchise created by Hironobu Sakaguchi. A man who graduated in computer science at Yokohama National University who fell in love with playing the Apple II game known as Wizardry during his years of study. Eventually landing a job working at Square and working on a few lesser known titles, Sakaguchi would be appointed as the company's director of planning and development in 1986. This was the same year as the release and success of Enix's role-playing video game Dragon Quest for the Famicom. During this time, he managed to persuade management to allow him to produce an RPG for Square. His 1987 Famicom game titled Final Fantasy drew inspiration from multiple fantasy titles of the period including The Legend of Zelda and the Ultima series. In an amusing turn of events, the game was originally intended to be named Fighting Fantasy, but trademark issues surrounding the title prevented this. However, this problem was the tip of the iceberg. Square were not in a healthy financial state over the period, so due to their dire circumstances, Sakaguchi would change the game's name in morbid fashion to be Final Fantasy, under the consideration that it could be the last ever Square game. As we know though, the game would be hugely commercially successful and well-loved by Famicom owners. In fact, it would make history as one of the most influential and successful role-playing games on the 8-bit hardware, building on the genre's popularity that Dragon Quest had established. The game would obviously be the beginning of a media empire, with two more Final Fantasy games being published on the Famicom and a further three mainline games being published on the 16-bit Super Famicom. The games would consistently go from strength to strength on the Nintendo platforms, with the games becoming bigger and more epic as time went on. Following the April 1994 release of Final Fantasy VI, work would commence on a seventh Final Fantasy game. This would take place almost immediately with the next instalment in the series planned for release once again on the Super Famicom, which would have been the fourth title made for the hardware. After being now with the company for many years, shortly prior to the development of Final Fantasy VI, series creator Hironobu Sakaguchi would reposition himself to be a producer of the title, granting more active development roles to other people. Some of the directorial role would be handed to Yoshinori Kitase, who did such a great job with the game that he would be given the solo director's chair for Final Fantasy VII. 
The publication known as GameFan would publish in their March 1995 issue claiming that Final Fantasy VII for the Super Famicom was rumoured to feature Donkey Kong Country style SGI graphics and the game was going to be released on a 64 megabits cartridge. This, however, is likely to not be true as demonstrated by this screenshot of the Super Famicom game's early conceptual phase within the Final Fantasy 25th Anniversary Ultimania book. The image clearly displays a 2D sprite-based graphics showing Locke from Final Fantasy VI as a placeholder character. One of the other reasons as to why development was halted on the system was because another team working at Square was struggling with the production of the ultra-ambitious Chrono Trigger game. So it was all hands on deck at the company to help make that game the high-quality product that it would turn out to be. Following Chrono Trigger being finished first, though, it was back to work on the Final Fantasy title. Over a course of time, lots of different ideas were battered around for the game, including a New York-like setting, the sorceress character known as Adia, who ended up being held back for Final Fantasy VIII, and even ideas that would be saved for Parasite Eve, a game that Square never actually bothered to release on the PlayStation in Europe. And it's a game that I still bloody want. There was also a period where the game was intended to revolve around a detective story featuring a hot-blooded investigator named Joe in pursuit of a group who blew up the city of Midgar. As we now know, with the product that eventually turned up on the Sony PlayStation, elements of this story remain, such as Midgar being blown up by a group and a group of heroes pursuing the mysterious villain of the game, Sephiroth. By late 1995, with both the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn being on the market in Japan, Yoshinori Kitase was beginning to become concerned that the Final Fantasy franchise would be left behind if it did not manage to catch up with 3D computer graphics of the time. A graphical style that was growing and growing in popularity. This would lead to the development of the 2D Final Fantasy VII being scrapped and in its place the early stages of experimenting with a 3D game. Through this era, a team of approximately 120 artists and programmers were formed to use Power Animator and Soft Image 3D software, with a budget of more than 30 million US dollars being assigned to the project. That's a lot of bloody money! The first big task that would be undertaken by this team was to produce a short experimental tech demo called Final Fantasy SGI for Silicon Graphics Incorporated Onyx workstations. Technology that was of course optimised and implementable when creating a game for the upcoming Nintendo Ultra 64 game console. Final Fantasy SGI shows us a glimpse of what a Final Fantasy game on the Nintendo 64 platform could have looked like and the demo of the game features polygon based 3D renderings of characters from Final Fantasy VI taking part within a real time battle. This turn-based affair sees Terra Branford, Lock Cole and the ninja known as Shadow fight against a huge monster. This five minutes long tech demo is an interesting time capsule displaying a pivotal period in history that could have gone one way or the other depending on which road Square would have opted to take. While most people would automatically assume that Final Fantasy VII would simply appear on Nintendo hardware behind the scenes, things were no longer as clean cut. While SGI hardware was utilised in order to make the 3D tech demo, Square had still not committed themselves to the Ultra 64. You see, the world of 3D gaming was new and uncharted territory for Square, as it was for many development houses of the period. A switch from the easy path for them of creating 2D games over to a more challenging, riskier option of building a 3D game for a new generation of hardware would require a lot of tough decision making to get it right. History now tells us that it was common at the time for developers to often get this process very wrong, which led to all sorts of video game casualties through this era. Sorry Earthworm Jim. To rock the boat as little as possible, Final Fantasy VII for the Nintendo 64 certainly had a lot of benefits for Square. For starters, the entire Final Fantasy brand had found success exclusively on Nintendo systems and by this point, gaming fans simply expected Final Fantasy games to appear on Nintendo hardware. 
The first big stumbling block though, of course, came when Nintendo opted to stick with cartridge-based media for their Nintendo 64 rather than taking advantage of CD-ROMs like both the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation. This meant that Nintendo 64 cartridges featured extremely limited storage capacity in comparison to their CD contemporaries. Pair this with the escalating price of cartridge costs. This seemed like a terrible option for the Nintendo console, both in terms of game size and scope, as well as manufacturing costs for developers. Reportedly, prior to Square pulling a Scott Hall and Kevin Nash by jumping ship, there had already been some behind the scenes disagreements between Square and Nintendo, where Square would address some of their concerns with the Japanese giants with regards to their decision to stick with cartridges. Shinichiro Kajitani, vice president of Square USA, told the company regarding the Ultra 64 that they are going to need a CD-ROM drive for it. As with the system's current features, the bandwidth did not exist to be able to produce a large 3D JRPGs for the device. Now you're playing with power. A lack of Nintendo power. Kajitani states that Square gave Nintendo plenty of good advice, but were completely ignored. He claims that Yamauchi-san, the president of Nintendo, refused to listen to anything they had to say, and it was at this moment that the company would begin exploring additional options for all upcoming projects. Still, one possibility would end up lying on the table with the announcement of the Nintendo 64 disk drive peripheral, which would allow for games with greater storage capacity. Despite this, this was no CD-ROM and Nintendo were yet to produce a 64DD development kit for programmers to experiment with. After the prototype changed specification a number of times, a real-time version of Final Fantasy VII ended up being discarded during the early testing phase with the hardware. This was partially due to Final Fantasy's classic Behemoth Monsters 2000 Strong Polygon model placing excessive strain on the Nintendo 64, resulting in terrible frame rates. How embarrassing for a game console that was being marketed as the most powerful in existence. Through some calculations, Square would come to the conclusion that in order to produce the game they had in mind, Final Fantasy VII would need to be spread across 30 64DD discs. Meaning that to make a decent 3D role-playing game on the Nintendo 64 would be completely impossible with the data compression methods of the period. Sakaguchi claims the game began to become huge in scope as a result of using a lot of motion data and CG effects and still images. It turned out to be a mega capacity game and therefore we had to choose a CD-ROM as our media. In other words, we became too aggressive and got ourselves into trouble. Faced with the state of technology and impressed by the increased storage capacity of CD-ROM when compared to the Nintendo 64 cartridge, it just made sense for Square to shift development of Final Fantasy VII and all other planned projects onto the Sony PlayStation, even meaning the inclusion of pre-rendered movies was possible too. Square's jump to work with Sony marked one of the biggest studio jumps in history, with the news being publicly announced in 1996 that all planned future games would be for the PlayStation, with Final Fantasy VII being the most anticipated of them all. A character and battle visual director working at Square, Tetsuya Nomura, brings up that he remembers this day well, stating, I remember walking down the hall when Sakaguchi-san stopped me and said, Hey, look at this. He was wearing this jumper jacket and he turned around and showed me the PlayStation logo on the back. I stood there kind of dumbfounded. I was pretty low on the totem pole at Square back then, so I couldn't really say anything in response. And in any event, even if he had talked to me about it, I was only in a position to nod and agree with him. Look at me. You work for Sony now. Sakaguchi-san, hey! Is she having a laugh? Kitase mentions that in order to help promote the shift to PlayStation hardware in Japan, Square would place an ad in Shonen Jump magazine, a publication that was circulated to 6 million people per issue. This paired with some solid TV advertising established in the region that Final Fantasy's new home was now with Sony. Kajitani, the man we mentioned earlier who had spoken with the president of Nintendo directly, said it was Sony who approached Square. 
asking them if they wanted to develop 3D games for their system instead of Nintendo. This encouraged them further to experiment with both Sony and Nintendo hardware. Hiroshi Kawai, a character programmer at Square Japan, brings up that when comparing the two systems, they would quickly discover there were more benefits to the PlayStation than just a greater storage capacity. It was one of his responsibilities to write performance applications and compare how where the hardware fared against each other. Part of this process would involve where you'd have a bunch of 2D sprites bouncing off the screen and see how many polygons you could get within a 60th of a second. And even without any kind of texturing or any kind of lighting, the Nintendo 64 offered less than 50% of what you would be able to achieve with the PlayStation. He states that there is no way you could have had anything close to the PlayStation version of Final Fantasy VII on a Nintendo 64. Nintendo 64? You mean you have to use three hands? That's like a baby's toy! Tomoyuki Takechi, President and Chief Officer at Square in relation to the Sony PlayStation deal brings up that Sony gave them an offer they could not refuse, one of which was better than Sony had offered to any other publisher. He states that whilst he cannot talk about the finer details, basically Sony went very low on the per unit royalties that they had to pay for, a far more attractive offer than Nintendo would ever be willing to entertain. Takechi states that this deal would obviously make their relationship with Nintendo very unfriendly at the time, with years passing without the parties talking. Kajitani adds that for a decade Square were banned from Nintendo's offices. But that made sense as their new job was to help make sure Nintendo lost the console war as that was not only good for Square's business but consumers too as Nintendo would not be able to keep forcing prices up. Going back to Kawhi, who advocates that the PlayStation is the better system of the two, he does comment that the likes of Mario and Zelda on the hardware are very impressive games, but games like that are the extent of what the Nintendo 64 could actually pull off. He mentions the recount he heard at the time from when Square revealed to Nintendo they were no longer doing business with them, and that Nintendo's immediate response was, if you're leaving us, then never come back. Regarding Square's departure, in an old interview online from 2001 with Square President Hisashi Suzuki, he claims that Nintendo were not that frustrated at the time that Square left. Relations would go completely sour at a later date after Square leaving had a ricochet effect, convincing many other developers that it was a good idea to do so too, including Enix. While accounts vary on how much bad blood, if any, was involved between the two companies, there cannot be any doubt whatsoever that by having Square begin developing games for Sony hardware, that it was the right move. Bigger and better games? Developers getting paid better? What's not to love? The Sony PlayStation is one of the greatest selling consoles of all time and Final Fantasy VII on the hardware is among its most beloved iconic games. A playable demo was included on a disc giveaway at the 1996 Tokyo Game Show, dubbed Square's Preview Extra, Final Fantasy VII and SIGGRAPH 95 works, which included the early test footage of the SGI game we mentioned earlier in this video. To proper realise the ambitious vision of the game, the title's Sony PlayStation release was held back until January of 1997, where it would begin selling in record numbers, becoming the best-selling Final Fantasy game in history up until that point, and becoming the first mainline Final Fantasy game ever to see release in Europe. It is quite hard to imagine a smaller week of Final Fantasy VII instead seeing release on the Nintendo 64, so thank god that Sony came along with their CD-ROM based media, making Square an offer they simply could not refuse, resulting in one of the greatest games of all time being made and the entire video game landscape evolving. I am Lady Decade and that was the story of Final Fantasy VII for the Nintendo 64. If you enjoyed today's video looking back at Square's jump from Nintendo to the PlayStation, then you may enjoy my recent upload covering the making of Shenmue and the period in time where the game was in development for the Sega Saturn. 
If you are new here, do not forget to like this video, hit that subscribe button and ring that notification bell in order to be notified whenever I upload a new video. Since uploading content more regularly, I am hugely grateful to all of those people who have found enough enjoyment from my content to decide to back this channel on Patreon. Speaking of which, I would like to give extra thanks to the following people, as these patrons are top banana. Green Cooper, Sebastian Velez, House of the Ted, Alvaro Cardoza, Thibaut Baggins, Sir Landry Does Gaming, Christopher DiVieo, Scott Healy Dendritti, William J. Scott III, Richard Turnbull, Paul Watson, Triforce of Shadows, Beyond Many, Johnny Holly, Venthros. Jesus Gonzalez, Irk the Irk, OPC, Emu, Movies.com, PWND Games, Consoles, Accessories, John McCormick, Corey Udekirk, Joshua Collard, Ben Harradine, Gaspar Hiller, Instant Gratification Monkey, Sagmeister, and Ago. As well as all of the rest of all of my lovely patrons, thank you all so much. Goodbye.